Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Dan and Joe Sports Show. As always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe. And uh, tonight we're joined by a special guest, Cole Kublik of ESPN and of Jox's McElroy and Kublik. And Cole, really appreciate having you on the show tonight. Hey, absolutely, guys. Glad to be with you. I appreciate you having me. And, and Cole, I saw you at the Senior Bowl when I was working it as part of the uh, the committee for the other weekend. I was really excited to get you on. The first thing I kind of wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, with everything going on, Brian Harson, you experienced a coaching change while you were at Auburn. You started off, Terry Bowden was your coach initially, and then midway through, uh, you had Tommy Tuberville become your head coach. What was that like, and what would you, what would be your advice to the players that are on Auburn's team right now about how to deal with that situation? Yeah, our, our situation was was pretty strange. I mean, we, we went to our we went to our team movie on Friday afternoon in Opelika, and then we would drive over to Lagrange after that to spend the night. And instead of going on to Lagrange, we went back towards Auburn. And this <laughs> there weren't a lot of cell phones back then, but there were a couple of kids on the team that had them, and their parents were calling them saying, "Hey, Feinbaum's saying that that Coach Bowden's getting fired." And we, we kind of thought, this, that, that can't be real. We have a game tomorrow. We play Louisiana Tech tomorrow. And sure enough, we drove back to Sewell Hall, went into the Sewell Hall dining room, all sat down. Coach Bowden came in, told us he wasn't our coach anymore, walked out. And that was it. And it was done. Um, Bill Oliver became the interim. Some guys were mad. Some guys were happy. Um, it became very strange. And I think it, in that instance – Right there, and this is why I always say I, I, I hate midseason coaching changes. Is I saw firsthand just what happens when when a head coach leaves, and this is not really anybody's fault. And, and I don't point fingers at guys because it's it's probably what you should do. It's human nature, but I don't think people understand that the lack of coaching that begins to take place, the lack of development that begins to take place, the lack of time at the facility that is spent. And just the educating on football that happens after that goes down. Um, you know, there were some coaches that were checked out. There were some that weren't. Jimbo Fisher was on that staff. He wasn't, he wasn't checked out. I mean, he, he coached us up pretty good. Um, but there were guys that were worried about their jobs. We heard them. They would tell us. Um, you know, there were, there were coaches that didn't believe they'd be back, didn't think there was any chance they'd be back, didn't care if they were back. Some, some took off right then. They were just done. They said, forget it. We're out. So then you have either a GA coach in that position, or you have multiple coaches handling or a coach handling multiple positions. It just became a cluster. And, and it was when I, when I think back on it, it's really kind of sad to think that there was a lot of extra film study, developmental work, fundamental work, just coaching time that we could have gotten that we didn't get. Um, and then when the new coaching staff comes in, it's it's a lot less development on the front end because it's a weeding out process. And you're and this is one thing that Brian Harson is kind of going through right now. He's trying to make sure that he gets his kind of guys in that facility on that practice field that are going to do things his way and they're going to buy into what he wants to do and what he believes in. And if you can't get that, then you probably shouldn't be around. We had guys that quit the first day of winter workouts. We had like eight guys walk out first day of winter workouts when Tuberville came in. And I can remember I mean, there, there's, there are little things that you don't think about and that you don't consider. Um, you know, I, I, I can remember a couple of guys from Mississippi, Ryan Hooker and Kendall Simmons and Jeremy Tungit, Brandon Taylor, and they were worried. And I didn't really, I didn't really get it. I didn't understand it. And I wasn't really recruited by Old Miss. So um, for whatever reason, it just didn't happen. And, and I, didn't, I just kind of didn't put it together. And then one day I, I just, I asked them mm -hmm. and they said, man, you realize like we were, we were recruited by these guys at Old Miss. We turned them down to come here. We're afraid that they're going to be pissed and that we're not going to really get a fair shake. And I would have never thought about that. And I don't think many other people on the team, I don't think people in the media I don't think people around the program would have thought about that, but it was real. And, and once they brought it to my attention, I understood it. And I thought to myself, damn, that's, that's real. I mean, I, 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 I don't blame them for being concerned at all. So it's just, it, it, it's either, I, I think you're either in or out, mm -hmm. honestly. And you got to make a decision as a player early on that I'm going to do everything I can. Some of this, I'm not going to like, some of this is not going to go my way. Um, 
but this is a fresh start. And that's hard if you're a guy that started two or three years. If you're a guy that was a high profile recruit, uh, you know, sometimes you don't feel like you should have to reprove everything that you've done. But the reality is this new staff is going to, to most likely force you to do that. So it's, it's just a, and again, college football is very different right now than it was then. So, you know, I, the transfer portal was essentially a death sentence when I was in school. There were very few guys that left and ended up somewhere else and had a very successful career. It just didn't happen. And most guys went down a level. So you didn't have a lot of guys go from Tennessee to Alabama or Florida to Ohio State or Texas to Missouri. You went to Jacksonville State or North Alabama or, you know, Florida A&M. Like th those were the schools that people went to because you didn't want to use your eligibility and just I guess the other schools weren't really going to wait around for a guy. So, and there wasn't a graduate transfer rule. Like, none of that was in place. Now, there are so many options for guys to get out and go do something else that it just becomes very different for exactly what they want to do. So, my advice would just be, you need to make a decision pretty early that you're either going to be in and give it everything you've got and grind through it and fight through it, or you're just not going to be comfortable being uncomfortable and you probably should go somewhere else. Well, Cole, what were the differences between playing for Terry Bowden and playing for Coach Tuberville? Because I remember Tuberville a lot more when I was in school there. He was the coach the first two years I was there before Chizik came in. And I just more remember Terry Bowden when I was a kid, but I don't remember a whole lot about it. What were their differences in their coaching styles? Both guys, they're, they're actually pretty similar. You know, both both guys, both guys were players, coaches. Um, Tommy probably a little bit more dialed into individuals than Terry was. Um, but, you know, Terry also, you know, had, was very hands-on with the offense. You know, Tommy was much more the CEO. I can remember Tommy would, would, he would allow media to come to practice and he would take his golf cart around and you know, he'd go spend a period or two over there talking to the media. And we kind of laughed at it then, but you think about it now, and it was actually kind of brilliant that you know, he was trying to get those guys on his side. He was trying to make sure that, they, that people were saying positive things or understood what was going on. Or if there was a guy that was banged up, you know, he could kind of off the record, let people know like, Hey, you don't need to write about that guy, you know, dropping passes or not making tackles. He's been battling through this injury. We just don't want it out there. He could control a lot of narratives by doing that. So, you know, that I think that's much more difficult to do nowadays because you know, everybody's looking kind of has their own agenda and it, there's, a lot less trust in the media now than there was back then. Um, but Tommy kind of let his coordinators go and let it, let them do their thing. Terry definitely let Bill Oliver do his thing, mm -hmm. but he was very hands-on with the offense. So, um, you know, the strength and conditioning part of it was very different. Terry was, you know, strength first, condition second. Tommy was the exact opposite. Kevin Yoxel came in. We were conditioned first, lift second, which was the opposite of what we had done. So it was frustrating for a lot of guys that were strong on the team. But uh, all in all, stylistically, I, I don't think they were truly that different. Um, Tommy may have been a little bit of a better communicator. Terry was very understanding. He, he was not, you know, a, an uber disciplinarian by any stretch of the imagination but he expected you to, to manage it yourself and kind of handle it yourself. So he didn't put up with a lot of BS, but he also you know, gave guys long leashes. And if you, some of the guys got kicked off those teams when Terry was there, trust me, there, there was a lot going on, a lot that was going on. And sometimes you saw guys get in trouble because of that, because they probably felt like they can get away with more. Hmm. And then they extended that leash and things didn't work out. You know, Tommy kept a little bit of a tighter grip on the team because uh, I think he understood you know, we don't, we don't want to risk a guy thinking he can do it his way, or we don't want to risk maturity, basically, at this age. Like, we'll handle that ourselves. And um, that would probably be one of the bigger differences also. Uh, Cole, I wanted to ask, I know Brother Oliver took over at the end of that 98 season, and I kind of see a lot of parallels between him and Kevin Steele. Was there a big push for – for Brother Oliver to get the head coaching job right then after being in the interim, kind of like what we saw with Kevin Steele last year? Yeah, there was. Um, all the defensive guys wanted him for sure. Um, I, don't, I don't know a guy that played on that side of the ball that didn't want him to be the head coach. Um, now, offensively, there were some guys that just didn't really know, weren't really sure, or your know, brother kind of had a little bit of a different philosophy where he felt like the best athletes should play. 
So there were certain guys at certain positions that knew, you know, they like Ben Lear was a great example of that. And we had conversations about it. And Ben told me, he said, if, if brother gets the job, I'm leaving. I'm going to transfer uh, because I don't think I'll play. I think Miko Collier will play or Gabe Gross will play. And I don't think I'll have much of a chance because I'm not a great athlete. I think it can be a great quarterback, but I'm not a great athlete. And, you know, I, I didn't like hearing that from him. He was one of my best friends on the team, but it was understandable at the time. And but there were also a lot of guys you know, on the offensive side of the ball that saw how he treated their players and would have loved to have had him be the head coach. I was one of them. I thought he would have been a great head coach. I, I know I would have played my ass off for him. And I think most of the guys would have as well. So um, I think the majority of the team, I would say higher than 80 percent, probably closer to 90 percent would have loved to have had him been our head coach. But there were some guys for whatever reasons, different reasons, some very valid that just didn't feel like that would have been in the best interest. Well, Cole, you mentioned Ben Leard. I mean, he was the starting quarterback of the 2000 team that won or that made the SEC championship and lost the game to Florida. Uh, you were also on the 97 team that made the SEC championship. Can you, can you explain the differences between those teams and which one do you think was, was ultimately better between the Damian Craig 97 team and the Ben Leard 2000 team? Who? I, I can tell you this, the 97 team was a hell of a lot more talented. I mean, you're talking about Victor Riley, Fred Beasley, Takeo Spikes. Um, I mean, that, 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 team, that team had some dudes. And I, I still to this day believe that if we had just put Kevin McLeod at fullback and Fred Beasley at tailback, we, we might not have lost that year. Mm -hmm. uh, but we put Damien in some bad situations where he felt like probably he had to go over and take over games and he had to be the guy. You know, we put the football in the air a little bit too much sometimes, and it just, you know, there wasn't a lot of balance. And when you're not balanced, it's going to catch up with you at some point. Um, I, I think the 2000 team, we had Rudy Johnson, so we were much more balanced. And, and obviously, you know, I think the offensive lines were, were about equal. You know, we, we did have Kendall Simmons, um, who went on to play in the NFL for a while. Mike Basile played in the NFL for a little bit. Uh, we were a little more athletic and tied in with Robert Johnson. And I think the receivers on that 97 team were definitely better. You know, Tyrone Goodson never gets enough credit for how good of a player he was at Auburn. Um, you know, Carson Bailey didn't have a great game, but he was solid. Hicks poor was a really good wide receiver as well. Um, so we didn't have that kind of juice in 2000 with what we had at the wide receiver position. But you know, we had some guys like Reggie Worthy and Clifton Robinson that could make plays when we needed them to. But we were a run first football team and that made it easier on our, on our defense. And, I feel like the defense is probably – I mean, the, the 97 defense was more talented. I mean, Martavius mm -hmm. Houston, Tequila Spikes, you know, Jimmy Brumball, Leonardo Carson, like that. We had, we had, we had dudes. But, you know, the, the, the 2000 defense was a, a solid unit. You know, guys like Rob Payton, Alex Lincoln, they just knew where to be. They knew how to get there. You know, DeMarco McNeil made a lot of plays for us inside. He's a really good player. So, I, I would just probably lean 97 because much more talented at quarterback, um, much more talented top to bottom as a team. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think that if you were to put those two teams against one another, you know, with us being able to control the ball in 2000 and with us being more balanced in 2000, I think there would have been a good chance we could win that game just because, you know, we, we had Rodney Creighton, we had Larry Kasher who were playing corner. Yeah. So that could take a lot away from what teams wanted to do on the outside. Um, and that allowed we, – we didn't have to – you know, we could bring more pressure if we wanted to, didn't have to if we didn't need to. So we could really be versatile on that side of the ball. Um, one of the big differences was, you know, John Lovett versus Bill Oliver, that ain't even close. Mm -hmm. you know, Noel Mazzoni and Jimbo Fisher, that's – to me, that's pretty even, uh, even though most people are just going to immediately lean Jimbo, which I understand. But Noel Mazzoni is a brilliant offensive mind. I think the offenses would have been pretty, pretty simple, uh, pretty close. But if you're talking about John Lovett versus Bill Oliver, that ain't close at all. So that would have been another probably big lean for the 97 team. Well, Cole, it's an interesting uh, question. I've never been asked that before. Yeah, I mean, that's just something I think about. I'll look at all those kind of SEC championship teams we had, and those are ones that I remember. I remember that game against – Tennessee in the SEC championship game. I don't know. Was was that one? Were you starting at that point, or was that that would have been your freshman year, right? No, I was playing. Yeah, I was playing special teams then. I was I was backup center on that on that team, so I was not starting at, at that time. I was Twasky Dunnigan, but um, yeah, it was. I mean, I was still, I was just a super talented team, man. Like some real dudes. Takeo was the real deal, and Ricky Neal was really good next to him. 
Um, you know, Fred Beasley, Kevin McLeod, both really good. Markeith Cooper helped a lot, a little bit at tailback. Damian was real deal, you know, at quarterback. You know, you'd love to see a guy like Damian be able to play in today's offense, just to see what he could be able to do. So it's um, it would have been fun. It would have been interesting to see those two go toe-to-toe. Yeah, definitely. I would especially love to see Damian do that. I'm from Mobile, so I've always been a big Damian Craig fan. Yeah. No, Damian's – I mean, he's the best. Again, kind of like Tyrone Goodson, more people obviously know Damian and know about him, but I still don't think he gets enough credit for how good of a football player he was in college. Like, people just don't realize – what a playmaker he was. Because people go back and look at the numbers and they're not, I mean, they're not what Pat Mahomes or Baker Mayfield or, you know, these guys are putting up these days. They're not close to that. But it's just the game was still so much different then that you weren't going to have the opportunities. And so, again, put him in some of today's offenses, Damien would be putting up those kind of numbers, no doubt. Well, Cole, speaking about different, I mean, you played twice and beat LSU in Baton Rouge. I mean, how happy are you now that you have to stop talking about you were on the last team to beat LSU in Death Valley for 20-plus years? Yeah, that thing was getting kind of old, to be honest with you. Um, you know, some people thought that we were wearing that as some badge of honor, but there, I don't think there was any real part of that. Um, you know, was, I guess it was kind of cool to be remembered somewhat every time it rolled around every two years, but then you started thinking about it and you're like, no, this is embarrassing. I, I don't, we don't want to be remembered for this. I mean, yes, we won the game, uh, smoked them in 99, 97 was actually an amazing game, Yeah, but you didn't want to be, you don't want to be remembered for your alma mater, not winning in a, a certain place for 20 years. Like that's just, that's not, a, that's not a positive thing. So I'm glad that's over. I'm glad we can kind of move on from it. Um, two really special games for totally different reasons. You know, 97 was overtime. 97 was Damian Craig, and it was Rondell Mealy and Cecil Collins. You know, Kevin Falk was hurt in that game, and those two guys just went absolutely nuts. I've, I've never heard a PA announcer stretch out individual player names as long as he did those two guys, especially Rondell Mealy, uh, when he would bust a long run. And we got it to overtime, and thankfully Damian drove us down, and we were able to find a way to win uh, one of the loudest stadiums I've ever heard. But then, you know, that was a game in 99 where – we didn't really know what we were going to be. We didn't know what to expect. We didn't really know how to operate. I mean, Clifton Robinson was playing tailback and forth some. We just didn't have certain guys that we really needed. And, you know, we'd go down there to Baton Rouge and just kick their ass. And it gave us a lot of confidence. It gave us a lot of belief, belief in the system. You know, I think Ben developed a lot of belief with Ronnie Daniels that day. And we realized that we could have a little something to the passing game. And defensively, we had some guys prove themselves. So it was just – it was something that we really needed. We had, we had to have. And, and we didn't end up going to a bowl game that year, but we were pretty close. And I don't think we would have even been in position if, if we didn't win that game the way that we did early in the season. I want to transition um, and ask you about the Brian Harson uh, situation. How did we get from like a week ago thinking he was going to be fired to retain now by Auburn? Yeah, I think the best way for, that I can describe it in, in the way that I've kind of described it on Greg and I's show is just that this was a situation that was based on emotions, mm -hmm. not necessarily facts. And you had a couple of guys that were in positions of power that emotionally, you know, their feelings got hurt when he was hired. They never wanted him. He wasn't their guy. And so they had probably been holding on to that for, I don't know, 10, 12 months. And then you get into a situation where an assistant coach leaves and his exit interview is not positive, And that riles up all these emotions and everybody gets angry and everybody gets mad. Oh man, oh, this, this SOB, we, uh, ah, we got to get it. Now's our chance. And then you get a couple of players that transfer out and go to different schools. Most of them didn't play. And they have a few things to say about, Oh, the coach was mean to me or he hurt my feelings, whatever. And so then those guys, are, ah, you know, this coach is mean. You know, he yells at people and, you know, tells people that they're not good enough to, to start. Ah, he fired a receiver coach in the middle of the season. Oh, man, he doesn't talk to us all the time. So all of these emotions are just churning up and burning and going crazy. And I think that people sort of started leaning on that, thinking that because of how mad they were would lead for them to be able to get what they wanted to get. And that was him out as the head football coach. So then you push it to where what has to happen to be able to get him out and that's this investigation to try to find information to say, yes, we're going to fire him. 
And not only are we going to fire him, we're going to fire him for cause. Well, when you present all your emotional information to a group, to a legal panel, to potentially try to fire someone for cause, I would probably assume without outwardly laughing, at least on the inside, they took a look at it and said, this has to be a joke. But you guys realize we can't fire people because other people don't like them. And that's essentially what you're asking us to do. And I think a few guys got ahead of themselves, started leaking some information to the media. Obviously, a couple of message boards went nuts. Social media followed in line with the message boards. We didn't talk about that shit on my show because I didn't think it was real. Actually, I knew it wasn't real. So I really wasn't going to get into it. And I think people took all of those emotions and all of those feelings and they rolled them into thinking that that was going to get what they wanted. And then when the facts had to begin to drip out, they weren't there. You couldn't find them and they weren't present. Therefore, nothing could be done at that time. They could have written an eighteen and a half million dollar check if they wanted to. But my understanding is nobody was ready to do that. So to me, it was based on it was a situation based on emotion that needed to be based on factual information. And when those two had to meet in the middle, it didn't even out. Well, Cole, let me ask you this. I mean, in my vague memory of when Terry Bowden got put out, I feel like there were some some equally, you know, salacious rumors that had no bearing in fact to it that was put out there. And especially with him in regards to one of the main boosters, Bobby Louder, who I don't think is really has the same kind of power that he used to. But did you see any kind of like parallels between what happened there and what they tried to do to Harson this time? I think there are probably a few. I I think, I mean, the parallels would be just that there are people in position of power that are attempting to make things happen, that are attempting to hire and fire and attempting to make football decisions, so to speak. So Mm. I don't know how qualified each individual is to make those decisions because I haven't had those conversations with them. So I I don't know. Um, I don't know who they talk to. I don't know how much ball they know. I, I, I don't know if they've sat in, you know, have they sat in coaches' meetings on Fridays for seven years, talking to different coordinators, talking to different assistants? Have they been on the field, talking to different co- coordinators and assistants and assistant coaches, and talking to people who recruit and talking to high school coaches? I, I have no idea. But it, it's, I think, where you could draw the lines as far as similarities would be, you know, people whose job is not necessarily to make those decisions to want to go make those decisions. But having said that, I will say this, there, there is, there's another side to all of that. And we can be mad and we can make fun and we can point fingers at people who donate a lot of money and give a lot of time and resources to universities like Auburn. And then, you know, want to be able to make these decisions. Some have been able to. And so it's just continuing that process. But there comes a point in time that Auburn's got to look in the mirror. And Auburn has to have an understanding that if you keep taking this amount of money from one individual or these individuals or these few people, they're going to want something in return. Mm -hmm. I mean, the girl who's hopping on the private jet with the old man and being flown to Vegas for steak dinners and getting bottle service and having stacks of chips thrown in front of her at the table to be able to play and going and buying, you know, seven pair of Christian Louboutins and Birkin bags, that guy's going to want something in return. He's not just flying her home and dropping her off. So if you're going to take, 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 the person that's given, 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 given is going to want something else. And in some of these instances, it has been Mm decision-making. Because I don't really know what the whole power, influence, control I don't know what that is I I really don't and if I was athletic director it would be the first question that I would ask what do do you want I'd sit down with with individuals and say what 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 exactly is it that that you want or you think you want because I'm going to try to get it for you because you've been really nice to us you've been really good and I'm going to go out of my way to try to get it for you but you need to understand you're I'm not going to be able to get it all so do you want a headset during the game do you want to call plays I can't let you call plays I'll get you a headset wired to your suite, but it's not going to have a microphone that talks back. But you'll be able to listen if that's what you want. We'll get you that. Do you want a locker with a uniform? Well, I can't get you one in the locker room, but I'll have our equipment guy set it up, and we'll come get you. We'll retrofit a replica stadium locker with all the uniforms at your place of business. So you can go get dressed every day if that's what you need or that what you want. 
do you want brunch with the head coach every Sunday? Well, I can't promise you every Sunday after games, but maybe five or six, we can get that done. You know, cocktails on Wednesday nights. I don't know if I can get the coordinators in for that every Wednesday night, but how about seven or eight Wednesday nights? We try to make that happen, but I don't know what they want. And, you know, by, by having this control and by, by having the decision-making power, who is, who is fact-checking, who is cross-checking, you know, who is the, who's the guy that is basically crossing the T's and dotting the I's on that, that being a good decision. I don't, cause it, cause if I just made every decision in my life on my own, without talking to my wife, without talking to my kids, without talking to my bosses, without talking to my co host without talking to my color and play by play guy that I work with, mm. got a lot of stuff that probably ain't going to turn out so well. Cause it's just going to be what I want all the time. And what I want is not always what's best for everybody else. So I, I, I do think that there is a, you know, there's a crossroads that a lot of times gets run into and things aren't really understood as to how they should work, why they should work or what they should be. But it's easy to just point the fingers at booster A or booster B. And I've done it plenty of times myself. There's plenty of times when I said, sit the F down and shut up and just back away. Mm -hmm. but their reality will tell you if you just look at the whole picture that if you're going to take everything from those guys for that amount of time, you also need to have an understanding. They're going to want something in return. Mm -hmm. That's just the real world. Cole, let me ask you this. You mentioned emotion that, you know, all this got brought about by emotion. If you want to look at this from an emotional standpoint, 99, your first year with Tuberville, we went five and six we beat LSU, beat Georgia, beat them both handily, but it was still a losing season. And I was at that 99 Iron Bowl. That was one that Auburn could have won and had a lead for a long time in with obviously Alabama being a better game. How was that season that much different than what we just had with Harson? And now they want to they want to fire him. Meanwhile, Tuberville went on to be probably the most consistent Auburn coach in my lifetime after they just let him build his team. I would almost – I would almost say that this past year was better because, yes, we beat we beat Georgia handily. We beat LSU. But, I mean, Jerry Donato got fired that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, that, wasn't a, that wasn't a great LSU team. Uh, the Georgia team was pretty good, you know, but we, you know, we struggled with – we struggled with some other teams that year that we probably shouldn't have. We I think – I think, you know, it, they're – it's interesting that you sort of point those two out because I do think they're similar in a lot of ways. You know, we fought and scratched and clawed. Um, you know, it took some things, it took some things happening for us to figure things out. You know, we went to, we went to Arkansas and it was a cold rainy day and it was coming off a of bye, and we started Don Timmons at tailback. Don Timmons was about a 181 pound walk on. And for whatever reason, Eddie Grant and Hugh Nall and those guys thought that was a good idea. And it did not go well. And Joe, double duty Davenport, dunked on us about eight times in that game. He just ran tight end seam right up the gut, and we couldn't stop him. And so the game's a little out of hand, and late in the game, they put Heath Evans in a tailback. And the, the, the deal with Heath was always that he was too slow. And I remember they put him at three technique earlier in the year, which is defensive tackle. And I remember going over to pass rush that day when they put him at D tackle and just, I mean, I literally just laughed my ass off seeing him lined up over there. Like, this is a joke. Like this dude is, has no idea what he's doing. He's not built like a defensive tackle. Even if he weighs 255, whatever he's, he's not, this is not going to work. And it didn't, it was bad for him. Bad day of practice for him. But then Anthony had tried to make linebacker and just all kinds of stuff. But then we're getting blown out in Arkansas, and they put him at tailback. And next thing you know, well, that inside zone and that outside zone and the counter and the truck plays that we ran, like him being just a, a little bit of a step slower kind of allowed things to develop and him get north and south, and he could grind out some yards. And then things 
kind of started going. Well, then we could play, play actions off that. And Ben and Ronnie Daniels and a couple of guys had some good chemistry. So we had a pretty good offensive line that year. You know, we just didn't have much at running back until we found Heath later in the year. And we had some injuries that hurt us too. You know, Ben broke his collarbone that year. Um, you know, I got a little bit, I had a little issue with my foot that year. And so we had a couple other guys that were kind of in and out, but you know, we, we showed a lot of grit, which I think that team this past year did. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of similar, they just sort of ran out of gas at the end, which, which, you know, you, like you said, that iron bowl, we I mean, were in pretty good shape. And then unfortunately they had number 37 and there wasn't a lot of people could do about that. That happened to us two years in a row, 98 and 99. Sean Alexander just went nuts. And both those games, I think, were – I think both those games were either seven or three-point games at the half, and then he just went nuts in the second half. So, you know, the, I think some of the parallels are there. Like, they – Bo Nix had to get benched to figure out how to become a better quarterback, mm -hmm. and then he did. He got better last year. Um, you know, the offensive line had to come together, and at times they did, but really – didn't very much they leaned on their defense a lot so yeah there, there are a lot of parallels there and I think now the problem the, there's a big difference between now and then in college football which is you know we we fast forward a lot a lot more and a lot more frequently now than we used to mm -hmm. we used to live in the moment a lot more in the years that you're talking about now everything is next Next, next, next. I mean, it's – I hear it and see it with Alabama on my radio show every day. You know, look at this tackle. Oh, wait till you see this next kid. This running back is having a great year. Oh, wait till you see this next guy coming in. Oh, this, this receiver. Wait till you see – oh, wait till, wait till you see the one we're recruiting now. And it's just a lack of appreciation a lot of times. And so I think now, instead of just looking at some of the bright spots and realizing, hey, this wasn't going to be a great year no matter what. Like, nobody was picking Auburn to win 10 games. Nobody. Yeah. And they were in a better position than anybody thought they would be halfway through the season, toe-to-toe -to -toe with Penn State on the road, and, you know, ranked in the top 15. And then, obviously, you lose five straight. Nobody wants that. It's not great. It's not good. And you look at the way you lost the Mississippi State game, the way you lost the Houston game, obviously a heartbreaker against Alabama. That makes it sting a little bit more. But if you just weigh the accomplishments, one versus the other, I might actually lean this past year's team because Ole Miss was really good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, they played with some other teams that, that were, you know, I think, I think they played competitively with some teams that were, that were pretty good. So I, I, there, are, there are similarities, but I just think the biggest difference is back then people knew it was a rebuild. And mm -hmm. people weren't willing to hit the reset button on coaches as quickly as they are now. And now a lot of people are unsatisfied with last year and they immediately roll that into this year. And so they're already unsatisfied with this year because of what happened last year, whereas 10, 15, 20 years ago, you may have been unsatisfied with this year, but you wiped the slate clean and you got excited about the next year. And that just doesn't seem to happen as much anymore as it used to. Carl wanted to ask you, but before we let you go, um, I've noticed the last few years, and this is not just a Harson problem, this this happened with Gus too. Auburn's offensive line recruiting just really went downhill, and I don't really understand why. I felt like when I was younger, we did a decent job of getting players like you in, to, got a really good offensive lineman. I mean, even in the beginning of Gus Miles on there, and I feel like the offensive line recruiting the last five years has really taken a nosedive, and I don't understand the reason beyond that. I, I, I'm not the one to really be able to point out all the whys because I'm, I'm as perplexed by it as you are. And you think about the Willie Andersons, the Wayne Gandys, you think about the Kendall Simmons, and then even, even like, you know, Marcus McNeil, there have been some big time elite. And I know Greg Robinson's had some issues, but I mean, Greg Robinson was the best tackle in college football his final year at Auburn. He just yeah. was. I mean, Number he was that dominant. And so you, you just, even some developmental guys like like a Ben Grubbs uh, that ended up being a really good player in the NFL. You know, I mentioned Mike Basile a little bit earlier. Without a neck injury, I think he's in the NFL for a long time. Like there, there have always been those guys, and even even I think players who, you know, similar to myself that didn't go on to have long successful NFL careers, but were good college players. Like you think about like Ryan Pugh was a guy that kind of comes yeah. to mind. Like he was a good college football player 
for a long time, did a lot of good things. There, there have always been those kind of players at Auburn as well on the offensive line. And there, even, there aren't even those kind of guys in the last few years. So um, it's, it's perplexing. It, it is frustrating. Um, and I, I can't even begin to put any sort of a reason on it, to be perfectly honest. It's just a, it's, it's a lack of talent, number one. But that doesn't always have to be what determines if that group's going to be good because you can be a less talented player and be a good offensive lineman and especially a good offensive line. I mean, go look at Baylor this year. Go look at Michigan State this year. Go look at Arkansas this year. Go look at Air Force this year. None of the Oregon State this year. None of those guys have a player that's going to be drafted in the first two rounds. Maybe not the first three rounds. And they all had really good offensive lines this year. You know, Baylor, you know, Oregon State was a finalist for the Joe Moore Award. Baylor was a semifinalist. Arkansas was a semifinalist. You know, Air Force was a finalist. Those teams weren't littered with NFL talent. So it's not just saying, okay, who are the five-star offensive linemen? Let's make sure we get them. It's also, okay, let's go get those developmental guys and bring them in and help them have great, you know, college careers, you know. Hugh Nall helped Jeremy Engel become a, a great college offensive lineman. He was a center on the undefeated team, played D tackle for three years. And then he moves over and, and has a pretty good career. You know, Hart McGarry was a guy that was physically limited, but he had a good college career and he was a good college offensive lineman. He played a lot of games. So those kind of guys haven't even been around the last few years. So I don't know where to start as far as just, it's not recruiting the right guys and not giving them enough development. And, you know, some of that, the previous scheme, uh, it's, it's a little bit understandable because it's just, it's kind of how they operate, but it's got to change now because if they're going to run what Brian Harson wants to run, that's a position that, that cannot be sacrificed. You cannot, you could get away with it a little bit with what Gus had wanted to do at times. Mm. You cannot get away with it, with this system, and this scheme. Yeah, that's a great point when you brought up like Ryan Pugh and Lee Ziembo while I was there. I mean, they were not guys that got drafted in the first round, but a lot of, a lot of great the coaches. Team. The yeah. 2010 team had one guy that played an NFL snap on the offensive line. It was Brandon Mosley. That's mm-hmm. it. Yeah. None of those other guys played in the NFL. And that's not saying they weren't good players because they were. But they got the job done, you know. And, yeah. and listen, yeah, the greatest college football player I've ever seen. That helps a lot. I get it. You know, there's there's not an NFL reception or rush attempt from that team other than Cam Newton. So it tells you how good he was and how special he was. But still, that offensive line got the job done on a regular basis to be able to help him do what he needed to do. So they're just it's it's very perplexing, and it's something that if Brian Harson is going to be successful, it's going to have to change. That's right. Well, Cole, thank you so much for having you on, and we look forward to having you on another time. Absolutely, guys. I appreciate you having me. Good conversation. Thank you very much. I thank you. And that'll be the end of our show. And as always, I'm Dan. I'm Joe.